Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today in My Career Conversations. I'm Jerry Hill, and I'm the Industry Council Lead for Discover Manufacturing. My Career Conversations is a great way for schools and companies to connect and for students to learn more about the career possibilities that exist in West Michigan. We have some exciting occupations lined up for you today, some perhaps that you've never heard of before or things that you didn't even know existed. I know that uh, when our three panelists today, our three career guides were, were younger, that they would tell you that they probably didn't know that these jobs were available to them. We have Derek Anderson from LG Chem. We have Eric Bain from FlexFab, and we have Mike Stevens from Rockwell Automation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Carol Distel is a business solutions representative that will be helping me with questions at the end. We look forward to having some great conversation today. Uh, if you have any questions during your presentations, please submit them to the Q&A function on the toolbar. If you're watching as a class, you can jot down your questions for your teacher to submit. We'll take time after the presentations to answer your questions. So each speaker is gonna talk for about 15 minutes, and then we're gonna have an opportunity to ask them questions directly. Okay, well, let's get started. With no further ado, Derek, um, tell us a little bit about what you do at LG Chem and why you love it. Well, um, hi, um, Derek Anderson, um, and I am a production uh, part leader here at LG Energy Solutions. And um, I like my job because of the fact that it's something new every day. And we always have different things that we're conquering. Um, as we have started our uh, battery manufacturing uh, about uh, 10 years ago here in Michigan. Um, so we are definitely um, busy and uh, tackling new challenges every day. So I love that aspect that it's constant change. Great. For folks that don't necessarily understand what LG Chem does, can you walk us through your job and kind of what you do in a day? Okay. And what LG Chem does? What, what do they make? So we make uh, lithium ion batteries for the automotive industry. Um, we have a few different customers with the, um, the big three automotive. Uh, so Ford, um, Stellantis, which is formerly Chrysler, um, and also uh, GM. So um, we provide the, uh, the battery cells and the battery packs um, for the vehicles. So there is a difference between a cell and a pack. Um, and the difference is, is the cell is just a singular um, battery that goes within a series of uh, batteries to make a pack. All right, so as I mentioned earlier um, with the questions um, that was asked, um, I mentioned about uh, the difference between a cell and a module. So I wanted to show you a slide um, that kind of explains what that is. So looking at the um, battery applications for a cell for a vehicle. So as you can see, a cell is uh, individual. Uh, so it can range from many different sizes depending on the model of vehicle. Um, and then once you get a module together and the module represents um, a variety of number of cells put together uh, within a series within um, a pack. And then we also in, in put those into what's called a pack. Um, so uh, cells make up a module and modules make up a pack. And then from the pack, those get put into the different vehicles. So that is one thing that is very crucial um, to our uh, success and our process is that we're able to go from uh, start to finish. So that's the big difference between, you know, giving a cell to a supplier or to the customer and then they put their own packs in or we will actually do it here at our facility. Thanks, Derek. Great job. We can easily insert that now and include it, I think. Was there anything else? Um, let me quick see here. Um, uh, I think that should be, that should be good. Okay. Derek, I'm sure you've got a little bit of a presentation for us here, but what, how did you get interested in, in manufacturing and the job that you do now? What was that process like? And tell us a little bit how you got started. So um, after high school, I actually um, went into the military. And um, after that, basically I got into the uh, automotive uh, manufacturing industry. Um, I started 
a small project, small company. And um, a few years later, I started liking what I was doing. And um, around 2006, 2007, um, there was a little bit of a change in the economy. And um, this opportunity for the whole electrifying of uh, vehicles came about and I did some research and I was able to find, uh, they had an open position uh, at LG at the time. And it was very interesting um, that the fact that when I got hired, I had to pretty much leave home for six weeks to go to South Korea for training. Um, so I was one of the first nine people um, that was hired from a, a leadership role. Um, and the leadership role at that point was called a senior technical operator, um, which is equivalent to like a, a team leader um, in the manufacturing world. So um, with that, uh, my career path there is just, it, it changed a couple of different times, but um, after going there, doing some training and seeing what all that is happening, um, it was very interesting. So I literally started from a senior technical operator. I went and got promoted to a supervisor. Um, and then I actually went to um, Human Resources for two years and uh, did a little bit there. And then uh, now I'm uh, promoted to uh, a production part leader. So, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting path and a little unorthodox, you know, most people would say, but um, there's a lot of good things that I've learned along the way um, to be in this role. What kind of schooling or classes did you have to take to learn the different skills necessary for your job? So I did go to school to um, get my uh, degree in operations management. Um, so a lot of statistics, um, a lot of, um, you know, business classes per se. So, um, you know, marketing, um, even psychology, um, also, um, you know, a lot of different math classes, um, not necessarily from an engineering standpoint, um, but there was low level classes that um, I had to take um, in order to get my degree um, for it that had to do with math. Um, but overall, a lot of things that you will learn in this job, we actually do the training here. Um, so it's not completely like your typical manufacturing job. So, so we do do a lot of training. We do have a lot of uh, uh, joint ventures that we have with other um, places to, to teach that, so. Great. What do you like most about your job? It's a little unpredictable every day because there's always a new challenge every day. That's, that's what keeps me going every day is that not really knowing, but also having the opportunity to make an impact um, very quickly and seeing the fruits of your labor. Tell us about some of the challenges that come up in your daily work and and, you know, a lot of our students always want to know if, if your job is stressful. I would say that it can be stressful, yes, uh, because you have a lot of demands uh, happening. Um, and also, you know, we have a lot of uh, cultural uh, things that we deal with here as well. And when I say cultural, meaning there's a, a language barrier at times, right? Um, so you figure out different ways to overcome that and uh, make things work. Um, and I think that would be probably the one thing that I would say makes it a little stressful, but we are creative when it comes to communication and, and that helps make it a little bit easier um, because we do a lot of PowerPoint presentations um, to help get our uh, points across and what we're doing. So um, it, it's, a, it's a good stress, I would say, because it, it forces me to learn more uh, than what I already know. Great. Hey, besides your background in the military and obviously some exceptional character, what personal qualities or abilities do you think are important to be successful in your role? Definitely being willing to learn. And when I say being willing to learn is because there's so many things that you um, will see and hear and do. Um, and if you think that you know everything, you're not going to be successful. But if you're setting yourself aside for a minute, listening to what people are saying and explaining to you, you will learn a lot. And it is an ever growing, ever changing um, industry, really at this point. I mean, 
from where we were before uh, to where we are now, I mean, we've, we've changed every single year. What course in high school do you wish you paid more attention to now? Chemistry. I'm sorry? Chemistry. Chemistry. Okay, good. Why? Why chemistry? Um, just because, you know, with all of the, the different products that we use and the makeup of them um, that goes within the batteries, um, and then just finding newer uh, materials to use to help, you know, um, strengthen the batteries, make them last longer, things of that nature, and just understanding the makeup of it. Um, I think that would have set me up a little bit better. I mean, we do have chemical engineers here um, that we definitely bounce a lot of ideas off of. So I would say chemistry uh, would be the first. One. I would say math uh, would be the second one. All right, great. Were, did you consider those to be your favorite subjects or even subjects that you were good at when you were in school? Absolutely not. <laughs> subjects. So, so. You had to apply yourself and work at it a little bit. What advice would you give to a young person, maybe kind of starting out and wanted, wanting to get into the same type of occupation that you're doing? I would say do some research. Um, look at, look on the internet, um, you know, just look up, you know, what's what's happening out there in the world. Um, look at different roles within manufacturing, uh, because a role here at LG that could be, you know, my same role could be a little bit different in a different company. Um, but there are some of the same principles that still apply. So definitely do some research and know, you know, kind of give yourself options because if you just narrow it down to just one thing, you're going to miss out on a lot. Great. Hey, walk us through your career progression a little bit, right? So you didn't start out at the top of your profession. You start out um, more in entry-level positions and that kind of stuff. When you first started working for LG Chem, you started out as, uh, you said, kind of in a leadership and operations, right? But then how did your career progress and, and how did your salary grow as well? Okay. So, so yeah, so when I first started, um, the senior tech role, um, that I was in is just a step lower than a supervisor. So um, that one is basically like you're troubleshooting a lot of the machinery. You're uh, making sure that, you know, people are scheduled and things of that nature. So you're handling more of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, so from there, um, I was in that role for four years. Um, I learned a lot um, within those four years. I had previous experience as a supervisor before um, so that also helped me to um, progress in that role. So I got promoted uh, to a supervisor, uh, level one. And then after two years, I was promoted to a level two supervisor. So of course, with the different level changes, um, the salary increased as well. Um, and then after me being promoted to a level two supervisor, um, I loved the role, stayed in the role for a while. Um, but then I started thinking, okay, what, what else do I want? Um, what, what else do I need? So uh, there was an opening in HR. Um, I definitely have you know, people skills. I definitely have those leadership skills and qualities. So I actually applied for a position in um, employee relations in the HR um, department and got accepted. So I did that for two years. Um, and then I basically got promoted to a senior uh, human resources business partner. Um, and then after that, I got a couple of certifications within the HR sector, um, which also helped um, grow my salary as well. Um, and then after the two years of being in uh, human resources, um, there was an opening back on the uh, production floor um, in the area that I'm in now. So to me, this was a great opportunity for me to actually use, utilize my degree that I achieved um, to show, you know, my strengths and show, show what I can do. And um, basically, you know, went through the interview process and, you know, there was a little negotiation uh, that came along with the salary part, but um, it's definitely not a bad thing to know, you know, what you're worth and, and what you can do and what you can give to the company. Um, so once I got accepted for that role, um, I've been in this role almost a year now. So it's been going well. Uh, we've definitely been breaking some uh, productivity records and uh, we are in charge of, you know, just making sure the lines are running. We have the proper manpower, the training and our machinery uptime and our quality 
Um, so then that way we can make sure that we're producing great parts um, for the fill. So that's my progression and it, it's going very well. And the salary is very comparable um, to, to what's happening out there in the field. Well, one last question before we kind of move on. I'm sure the students will have other questions for you, Derek, but um, I guess what's next for you? I mean, what are, what's the next position that you aspire to or the next step in the progression of your career? So I'm um, not sure if you guys know or not, but um, LG will be expanding uh, within this next year um, to a brand new building, a uh, brand new product. Um, so the next step for me will be is to progress into a team leader role, um, which is um, the role under director, which is under the president of the company. So that's what I inspire to do, uh, to go next is to a team leader role and um, have my own department. Well, congratulations. That sounds exciting, Eric. And thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge about your occupation today. We look forward to asking you some more questions. Absolutely. Eric, you're up next, sir. Welcome. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so yeah, I just, I'll, I'll just start out by introducing myself. My name is Eric Bain. Um, I work at FlexFab um, and I'm a advanced manufacturing engineering manager, sort of a mouthful. So I tend to abbreviate it AME manager. Um, and here, um, what we manufacture um, is a whole uh, wide range of products, um, but our sort of legacy business is a uh, fabric reinforced high temperature silicone uh, hose. Um, so that could be a, for a coolant application. Um, it could be a heater hose, flexible heater hose. It could be um, a charge air connector. Um, and then that, that's sort of that sector of the business. But then we also have um, a RTL process, we call it, which is a thermal forming process. So we use a traditional thermal forming press, but it's a very lightweight composite. Um, the pattern it, or a lot of the stuff that we work on is composites. Um, so sort of a, a little bit of a craft, a little bit less automated, a little bit more of a handcrafted product. Um, and then we also have an extrusion department, which is highly automated, of course. Um, and we run a silicone heater hose through that with uh, fabric reinforcement. Um, and that line runs continuously around the clock, um, seven days a week. So um, those are some of the products that we work on. Um, as far as my career progression, um, maybe we'll get to that in a second. Um, but um, yeah. And then uh, FlexFab, um, we actually, all of our products, um, they kind of range um, the whole spectrum as far as where they're applied. So we have an aerospace division, we have an automotive division, we have a um, heavy duty truck division and off-road slash construction. And then we also have specialty slash government and that can be anything. I mean, uh, all the way up to, I know we ship parts to L3 uh, Harris up in Holland, I believe. Um, they manufacture tanks and light armored vehicles, um, all the way to jet aircraft. So, and, uh, the company has been in business for 63 years. Wow. Um, it's privately owned and it's global. So, uh, a really good success story out of, uh, the small town of Hastings, Michigan. Eric, when did you know that you wanted to pursue a career in manufacturing? Did you know as a high school student, did you know before then, uh, was it not until you were in college? Was it not until you started uh, in an entry level position. Yeah, so um, I definitely was one of those people that wasn't really aware that engineering roles existed um, when I was in high school, which was unfortunate, um, but I was fortunate enough to be offered a uh, CAD slash drafting um, class um, in seventh grade. And I sort of latched onto that because I like to um, build things with my hands and I like to be creative and, that seemed to be a good fit for me, designing things and conceptualizing them in 3D for putting them on paper and then ultimately manufacturing them. Um, so yeah, I kind of started there. And as soon as I latched onto that, I took CAD drafting seventh grade all the way through um, my senior year. Um, and it was at, you know, when I graduated, I realized that um, there's uh, college classes um, that sort of are a continuation of the CAD classes that I'd already been involved in. So um, I went and got my two-year degree um, while I was working full-time at an oil chain shop, essentially. 
Um, and then I kind of, that kind of launched me into the workforce. Oh, that's great. So if somebody asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up, when you were a sophomore in high school, what would you have told them? I probably would have said a house builder, actually. I really enjoy uh, the craft of making houses. Um, again, it's something that you can kind of conceptualize um, and then put on paper and then um, build it, you know, and you get that satisfaction. Um, I'm a maker, you know, there's a whole maker wave, you know, on the internet. And um, I'm definitely one of those people. I like to make things. Cool. Well, this probably dovetails right into it, but what do you love about your job now? Yeah, so I'm in a little bit different role than I had been previously. I've only been in this position as an engineering manager for about a year now. And um, so I guess I'll speak just prior to that and then I'll speak kind of current state. So um, I really enjoy, again, the process of uh, designing and development, um, designing and developing heavy machinery. Um, so we have um, a whole plethora of internally developed machinery here at FlexFab. A lot of it's, you know, close to the best proprietary um, equipment. Um, but then we have our processes too. And I really enjoy working with those as well. So um, when I was in on the product design half of things, um, I was doing a lot of build to print quoting for uh, customers um, like Daimler, um, Packard Parts, um, Kenworth Peterbilt, um, Caterpillar and John Deere. And um, I sort of dipped my toe into the manufacturing side of things um, by kind of honing a process that I thought could use some improvement just in my spare time. And uh, the company kind of took a liking to that. And lo and behold, we kind of split the um, engineering department into two halves, the manufacturing half and the, uh, which we call the AME group, and then the outward customer facing side of engineering, which is the uh, applications engineer group. And I just um, was fortunate enough to wind up on the AME side of things. The company kind of saw my potential and uh, that I've been in this department ever since. Um, and then on the uh, engineering manager side of things, um, it's been a bit challenging for sure to kind of forego all of my technical skills and sort of um, hone the craft of managing um, seven engineers. Um, they're all great um, individuals. Um, some of them, um, are definitely looking to improve a little bit more than some others. Some are uh, are kind of comfortable where they're at. Um, they're all working on various projects and um, it's really awesome to be able to listen to the full range of issues that other people are having, personal issues, technical issues. Um, I try to um, I try to be um, as helpful as possible when they're asking those sorts of questions. So um, as far as what I like about it, I, I like to help people. I like to give them advice. Um, I also like working on the technical side of things. So when they have questions that are technical, I love writing on my whiteboard back here and, and having the powwow and, and trying to come to a really thoughtful um, and effective solution. Great. Besides the technical aspects, which you obviously have to be great at to be a manager and understand to be able to help others, how did you develop the leadership skills necessary to kind of take that next step in your career? So it really started with a lot of project management. So some of that heavy machinery um, that I developed and designed um, and sort of um, engineered, if you will, um, just especially from an energy standpoint, um, some of these uh, pieces of equipment require high levels of energy. Um, I was sort of given an opportunity to manage a cross-functional team. Um, so, and the thing about a cross-functional team that's difficult or can be difficult is you don't have any authority over those individuals but you still have to try to get them to do what uh, you need them to do, um, which can be challenging. Um, so keeping a good cadence, uh, meeting with people on a regular basis, um, making sure that everybody is uh, checking the boxes as you kind of progress through the project timeline, those are all really important things. And I think ultimately that project management skills would allow me to be a manager. Besides that, Eric, what? What uh, courses or um, skills work did you do in either high school or post-secondary school that, that helped you the most in your career now, do you think? Yeah, that's a really good question. 
I'm going to sort of piggyback off of uh, what Derek said there a little bit. Uh, math, for sure, is an area that um, pays dividends long term. If you can, uh, in physics, um, if you can go back to fundamentals and, under th and understand things at, at sort of their core level, um, it really can help you uh, in making decisions and making the correct decisions from an early uh, early on in the project. Um, and that way you're not uh, chasing dead ends. Tell us about a time where you were the team leader and you your team kind of made a big mistake and had to recover from it. What was it and how did you learn and what happened? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, we make mistakes all the time, uh, for sure. Uh, it's hard to hone in on one exactly. Um, but I can tell you that that's the best way to learn. Um, there's really no substitute for making a mistake. If you make a mistake, uh, it kind of gets burned into your brain and uh, you never make that same mistake twice. Um, and ultimately, I think that's what leads to an individual progressing. So um, I'm trying to think of a really good example. Um, I, I guess all I'll say is um, in this specific instance that I'm thinking of, um, you really want to try to do, uh, you really want the least impact on the company is sort of the goal, right? So you, everybody knows that we're going to make mistakes. What we want to try to do is you want to try to risk mitigate as much as possible. So spend time up front trying to understand back to, like I said, the fundamentals. Are there certain aspects of a design or a process that you're not necessarily sure will actually work in a production setting. If that is the case, spend the time up front at a low cost, if, if possible, to try to vet out a lot of those things. And then when it comes time ultimately to implement, um, there's less surprises. And therefore, the mistakes that you make will be much lower impact. That's terrific. One last question before we um, get into the Q&A questions from the students, Eric. But you know, what advice would you give to a young person starting out? If you were looking back at yourself 15 or 20 years ago, what advice would you give to the young you? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, when I, this is a tough one, but when I was 23, I decided to go back to school actually. And I started from sort of square one to get my uh, degree in mechanical engineering from GVSU. And um, if I could do it all over again, I think I would do that first. So um, that puts a little bit of pressure on you because you kind of got to know what you like earlier on um, in your career. But if you can do that, you can save yourself a lot of time and uh, avoid the mistakes that I made, which is sort of recursive um, schooling um, or redundant schooling that ended up not transferring to the university that I wanted to go to. So I think Again, I know that adds a lot of pressure to high school students, but if you can find out what you like, um, and I mean really like, because in my current role, I really enjoy um, what I do every day. And that makes it feel not so much like work and more like a hobby. Um, and um, I forget the saying, but it's sort of, um, if you find something you like, you won't work a day in your life. And I think there really is a lot of truth to that. So yeah, I just wanted to, uh, we had a few uh, supplemental slides and visuals that I wanted to just quickly share um, um, for everyone's sake. Um, the first thing, um, the first slide rather represents kind of our global reach um, spanning from the USA all the way over to Asia. Um, this is sort of the breakdown of FlexFab's um, business units with heavy duty truck uh, making up the majority of our sales, but then we have uh, automotive and aerospace following up right after that. Um, these are uh, pictures of um, some of the uh, products that we build and manufacture for our OEs um, for heavy duty truck. And then a few more for aerospace. So you can see some of these uh, thermal formed um, RTL ducts um, that are super lightweight. Um, and then I just wanted to share a couple of videos uh, of some of our automation processes. So here's the first one. FlexFab's commitment to research 
leveraging automation technology to make advances in quality, accuracy, and efficiency in our operations. FlexFab's latest venture into robotics has yielded a wide range of benefits. Robots eliminate errors, worker injuries and fatigue, improve the quality of products, save critical production space, and reduce labor costs. Coupled with automated vision inspection systems and 100% leak testing, our automated assemblies help FlexFab deliver high quality with greater consistency at competitive prices. FlexFab's advanced development processes are leading the way to more efficient processes, more precise parts, and more cost-effective products every day. Visit FlexFab.com now to learn more. Great video, Eric. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And then um, I just wanted to quickly touch on one more slide here. Um, so in this slide, it uh, sort of represents um, some examples of some of the CAD design I've done over the years. By no means is this a full portfolio, but just some quick examples to show you some of the machinery that we've developed here at FlexFab. Um, this is an example of uh, a design iteration. So you can kind of see um, how we go from sort of this rudimentary prototype or benchmarking um, similar to what you would do in school, you find an off-the-shelf item that simulates to the best of your ability what you're, what you're aiming for, and then you sort of develop or hone that um, device or piece of machinery into something that um, reflects what you're looking for um, and gives you all the cycle times that you're looking for. So I just thought that was a really cool um, example to share. Um, so this is a custom in-house designed hydraulic unit specifically made to actuate these um, expansion devices. Um, one of the big takeaways from this um, process was that I started with a screw and quickly found that I didn't have enough power. So um, what I did was I, or torque rather, so I traded um, cycle time for torque and I was able to get the torque that I needed, um, but then learned a hard lesson that I sacrificed all that cycle time and the operators were complaining. So then uh, naturally, the solution is to apply more power. So the more horsepower you have, the more torque and um, cycle time. Uh, well, more torque you get and less cycle time is um, present as a byproduct. So that was a really cool project. And then I just wanted to quickly touch on something. I feel like nobody does this. Um, but this is an example of a time that I've used all my math skills or all sort of all at once. So um, I wrote a program actually and used a heavy amount of trigonometry and uh, systems of equations to solve um, a problem and then used that in the background of a C++ um, calculation software to create an animation of what a bellows would look like in a flexed and unflexed condition. So those, those math skills, um, although sometimes it might seem not like you might not use them, um, this is where they shine, uh, sort of in the background of a uh, advanced program um, for a company that serves a very specific application. So that's all I had. Thank you so much, Eric. We learned a ton and great job answering our questions. We look forward to asking you some more. Well, Mike, last but certainly not least, uh, tell us about a, a day in the life of industrial sales. All right. So, so. My name is, is Mike Stevens, and um, I'm in technical sales. I work for a company called Rockwell Automation. Um, it's about a $7 billion company. We have about 23,000 plus employees. Uh, my West Michigan team consists of about you know, 60 sales and support team. So we are a technology company that works with almost every supplier out there from Kraft to Heineken to um, Chevron, Ford, GM, pretty much in every type of industry. So what do I do and, and where, where are we? I'm just gonna quick play a short video to kind of show you what Rockwell does. And then we'll kind of jump into some of the, uh, to answer some of the questions. Hey Mike, I don't know if you're sharing your screen. Is it not coming in? No. Oh, all right. Hold on. 
And, and Jerry, I was thinking, I, I guess I was a little blindsided by the questions too. Um, so I, I did have some stuff I wanted to share, but I don't know if you want to try to weasel that back in or how you want to work that. Well, we certainly can, Eric. I, I wasn't sure how you wanted to how you wanted to do it, right? I, um, if you had a presentation prepared and kind of wanted to jump in, or if you wanted me to help guide the questions, I, I wasn't sure either, right? So I just didn't want there to be a long, awkward silence. So if there's a piece that we want to um, kind of get a plug in for the company or show the video, we can edit that into perhaps one of the segments where, where I was asking a few of the questions. So happy to do that. What's your preference? Yeah, if we just want to do it on the backside, I, I know, I think Derek said he might have a bit of a PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, just a few visuals. I just don't want to bore the kids with just all talking. Right. And um, Derek, is that the is that the case? I thought that both of you had said that you did, but then we never really. Yeah, never yeah I have really a, a couple of slides. I mean, if you want, I can send you the presentation. And if you want to just pick out a couple of the slides that pertain to kind of some of the questions, I'm fine with that too. Okay. Yeah, that's not a bad way to do it. I think that, yeah, certain questions that you asked me, I think, you know, we just splice in uh, some of the slides. Okay, happy to do that too. Yeah, if you guys want to send them to me, I can go through them and tell our marketing team, hey, at the four minute and 23 second mark, we want, we want to insert this slide. Okay. Okay. All right. Jerry, Mike, are you able to see my screen? I am seeing your screen now. Yes, Mike. All right. Let's move this guy outside. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, yeah, my name is Mike Stevens, and I am in technical sales for a company called Rockwell Automation. So we're a technology company that's a seven plus billion dollar company worldwide, um, 23,000 plus employees. And my West Michigan office consists of about 60 sales folks and support teams. So some of the product or the companies that we work with um, from Kraft or Campbell's to Ford, GM or Tesla, um, pretty much any industry we're, we're involved in it. So I wanna play a quick video just to kind of show you who we are and then we'll kind of jump into just uh, how I ended up in a technical sales role. We live in a world inspired by curiosity. <clears throat> Once you start wondering how things work, the possibilities seem endless. How are these cookies made so perfect and so delicious? How are crayons made in every color in the rainbow? How does a robot learn and how will that make the world better? Answering these questions with our customers is what we do. At home, at work, or building the next generation workforce. At Rockwell, we're proud to be part of your everyday life. And to deliver on what's possible for tomorrow. We make the world more productive, intelligent, <clears throat> and connected. And we don't stop at how. We wonder, what if? What if we could find innovative ways to treat diseases or protect workers far underground or miles out at sea? What if? we could feed 10,000 hungry bellies a week, or millions. Our job is to help industrial companies and their people be more productive and the world more sustainable. At Rockwell Automation, wonder turns what if into what is. And that's expanding human possibility. All right. So, so as mentioned, I'm a, a technical salesman at Rockwell Automation. So probably even after watching this video, you may be asking yourself, what does that even mean? 
Well, at Rockwell, we sell technology, hardware like computers or monitors, push buttons, um, anything in the industrial world, um, all kinds of electronics that make machines run. We're a software company. So with software that allows the programming for that automation to all work together, um, we do uh, virtual and augmented reality, 3D emulation. So if you're into CAD work, we can bring that CAD to life um, as well as help with business outcomes. So in other words, we make businesses more profitable. So have I always been in sales? No, in fact, I have a pretty atypical path to where I ended up as a technical salesman. So I'm gonna go old school here and, and kind of go back to my, when I was 18, one of my first jobs I had when I graduated was selling cell phones and pagers. So the first flip phone that came out, um, looking back, I enjoyed sales, but I didn't know at the time that I would come full circle in my life. Um, and it's definitely not the direction I started off that way. So I've lived in West Michigan my whole life, attended Northview High School way back in 1993. And at the time, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do when I left high school, but at the time, I had a pretty cool accounting teacher, and I was acing his class, so um, accounting seemed like a fun thing to do, so that's kind of the route I looked at taking, but really not going down that Kevin from the office kind of accounting, you know, I was looking for more, a bit more gumption and poise, um, a little more sophisticated accounting role. Not being sure, I, I started out at GRCC. Um, attended there for about two years before I figured out I did not want to be an accountant. Um, I decided to try out manufacturing. My brother worked for a good manufacturer and said, you know, he could help me out and get me in. Um, sounded like fun, so that was the route that I decided to take. So I, I started out at a company called Prince Corporation, eventually became Johnson Controls out in Holland, Michigan. Started out as a line operator. Within a uh, couple of months, I, I quickly became a technician working under a tool and die maker. Um, it, was, it was interesting work and, and I started going back to Grand Rapids Community College to take classes around tool and die to, to start getting my apprenticeship classes in. Uh, my dad was in tool and die, my grandpa was in tool and die, so I thought, maybe that's a good route for me. Uh, I'll, I'll go into tool and die. Well, an opportunity quickly came up to become a lead technician uh, on a new line. So we were, we were the first Dodge Viper hardtop uh, coupe that was ever made, and we were doing all the interior. And that is me from 25 years ago sitting in that first uh, Viper. Um, so, so I jumped at the opportunity, and um, what working hard led to was an offer to join a maintenance department. Again, I was like, wow, no, I'm kind of thinking that tool and die route, but you know what? When opportunity knocks, I you listen. And so I decided to give it a shot. If it didn't work out, I could always go back to, to tool and die. So I, I started my apprenticeship to become an industrial electrician, um, continued on um, at the Career Line Tech Center um, and, and started my classes there and electrical classes. And that was me that made the cover of the magazine back in 1999, working on a lathe. Um, but I, I completed my apprenticeship. I received my journeyman card, an electrical um, journeyman card in 1999. A couple of years later, got my master's electrician's license in 2001. Um, and, and I'd say that I, I, I enjoyed the role. Um, I always enjoyed the electronics, the programming side of things, uh, the variety that, that, that maintenance brought into my life. Um, I moved a few times around in my career. Um, Started in maintenance, went into a launch engineering position, controls engineering position. Um, and then before coming into a technical sales role, um, I was a senior controls engineer at a company that kind of in charge of their, all their equipment technology and standards for equipment um, in North America. So funny story though, when I was in maintenance, uh, we talk about lessons learned and mistakes you've made. And I think paying attention is, is a mistake that I, uh, uh, something that I learned. So here's an injection molding machine. Um, an injection molding machine, it's, it's, they take plastic and they run it through the screw and they squirt it into a mold and that's kind of how you get a plastic part. So as part of my maintenance role, I had to clean the screw on the machine. So I pulled the screw out, it's like a 10 foot long screw and I have this wire brush, you got to clean all the plastic off. I'm wearing my shorts, I'm in my you know maintenance, I've got my earphones in, I'm doing my thing and um, start going, I stopped paying attention 
grinder catches my shorts. Instantly, I'm standing there on the shop plant floor in my boxes. So lessons learned, pay attention to what you're doing. I ended up calling a buddy to go get my keys, met him in the parking lot. But what I learned was, you know, keep that spare set of clothes in your car. You never know. Um, and listen to what your mother told you about wearing clean underwear. You never know when your pants uh, are going to get ripped off and some, <laughs> some maintenance type thing. So just a funny story. I thought that, um, you know, there's a lot of some things in manufacturing that can be dangerous, but there's also, you know, you pay attention, you do the right things, and, and there's a lot of safety protocols in place. So why did I pursue a career in technical sales? So first and foremost, you know, I had a, a desire to do more. Um, I, I loved what I was doing with finding solutions that the company I worked for enjoyed helping to solve challenges. So I started doing some engineering consulting on my free time as well. Um, and I think it was the consulting I did that really, it's when I got bit by the sales bug. I knew at that moment that, um, you know, I enjoyed the controls engineering role I had, but I, I loved the sales piece of it and I was ready for that change. So I'm gonna point out another thing that I feel is, is very critical in any career path you take, and, and that's um, building relationships. So work your hardest to not burn bridges. Take the higher road. Oftentimes your career will take you, um, your career you go into will have a small ecosystem all, all of itself. So what I mean is you continue to run into those same people over and over and over. So relationships are key. Um, I think it was this principle of relationship building that led to having someone at Rockwell advocate for me and sharing my drive and passion to the folks at Rockwell that helped give me the opportunity to sell myself and land a sales role that I have today. So I'm able to sell a lot of the things that I used my entire career. So all the things as a controls engineer that I touched and programmed, now it's all the stuff that I, I get to sell and it makes it pretty enjoyable um, and very exciting. So what skills and education are required to be in technical sales? Well, again, I, I took that atypical path. Um, this job typically would require a four-year degree, uh, but many companies out there will take work experience as well. And that's, in my case, it's exactly what happened. So I'm not an engineer by degree, but I'm an engineer by experience. So I've taken many college courses. Uh, the classes took always, you know, related to my job, um, um, from technical to business. Um, I've taken well over a hundred seminars and technical non-college courses as well, just to gain understanding and competency. And in fact, I would fight and beg to get to as many of them as I could because I always strive to be the best at what I do. And so the, the more you go after it, the, the people see that you, you're driven, you're motivated, and they're gonna give you those opportunities. Um, but I feel most important to su the success in any role uh, that you take on in your career, it's really, it really comes down to its desire, its passion, its self-motivation. Um, I didn't have that passion right out of high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and in my case, it, it found me. And I'm grateful and happy that I did because it's led to an amazing career. So things I get to do in my job. Um, I'm sure a lot of you like hot dogs, right? So one of the one of my customers, I got to go visit a hot dog plant to solve some of their, their safety issues. And we were looking at some of the things that we sell to help make them better. So watching it from the grinding process, right? To getting into that, that slurry of a hot dog that may make you not want to eat hot dogs again, um, to putting it into the casings and going through the cookers and everything else. It was a fascinating experience. And, and to me, that's one of the most enjoyable things is just seeing how people do different things. Um, there's all flavors of manufacturing. So whether you're doing robotic welding, you're watching automotive assembly liner. Um, I was just at a Coca-Cola facility last week, watching them make 1600 cans of Coke a minute. I mean, this machine's just flying by. Um, fascinating things to watch and look at and, and be able to help contribute to some of the technical things that they have to make the to make their processes better. Some myths that are out there maybe about sales. So maybe some sales out there like this, you know, the pushy sales guy or the perhaps the, you know, the door-to-door -door salesman and cheesy jacket, right? Um, that's not uh, I think that maybe you know what people think of with sales, but really if you align yourself with a company where you believe in the products, um, they have good products, 
it, it certainly makes sales easy to sell things, easy to be out there, easy to be talking about it. I'd say on a, on a daily level of, you know, what's a typical day look like for me? You know, I start out with my cup of coffee, maybe my feet up on the desk. Uh, no, in all seriousness, my, my job offers, as I said, a ton of variety. I personally don't like doing the same thing every day. I want to be challenged. I want new things to experience. Um, I'm self-diagnosed as ADHD, where I, I got to always have something different, always be doing something. And um, I think that um, being in the, in the role that I'm in, I get to see that. So maybe, maybe maybe vegetables aren't your style. Maybe it's, you know, your variety of life is something more sweet, right? Um, but the, the customer visits, being able to, to teach people about our product, being able to, to share the excitement of what our software can do for them and how we can bring their company to new levels, um, that's exciting. And that's what keeps me coming to work every day and keeps me driven. Um, from a stress standpoint, I think um, the stresses that, uh, you know, that I have in, in my role probably are really not much different than the stresses maybe you guys have at high school. Um, I think you look at uh, people, right? Um, you, you work with a lot of personalities and sales, um, and it takes an effort to really make sure you're getting along with people um, and, and, uh, and, and, and doing the right things and not burning those bridges like we talked about and, and uh, keeping those relationships up. I would say one of the other hardest things, and again, I think it's something that all you guys experience as well, um, it's, it's embracing change, it's being able to be adaptable to change. So take COVID, for example, um, from a high school student, it was, you're at home, you're learning from home, you're not seeing your friends, you're isolated. I mean, all those types of things. I mean, those are the same types of challenges that, I mean, we ran into on the sales side. You know, you stop visiting customers, you're doing more virtual meetings and things are hard, but I mean, it's, it's, it's stuff that's real world and, and you have to just kind of work through it to, um, to make things happen there. So I think embracing change and being able to adapt to it, um, it's one of the hard things and stressful things, but uh, um, you work with it and you have a good team, it, it makes it easier. I would say kind of just wrapping up closing thoughts, right? Um, words of wisdom I would, I would leave, leave behind are things I think in my career that have been impactful. Um, I'd say always go above and beyond what's asked. If there's a minimum that they're giving you, go the extra mile, do the things that they're not asking. This gets recognized, people see this, and, and it definitely makes you move up the ladder quicker. Um, arrive early and, and be willing to put the time in, so put those hours in. Um, it also helps you become the best. I mean, the more hours you're contributing, the better you're gonna be at it because you're exposed to it. I'd say when you find your passion, you'll know it. And you know, when you're passionate, uh, as, as Eric was alluding to, you know, it, it really doesn't feel like work anymore. Um, it, it feels fun to go in. So be kind, have empathy for people, and try to, you know, think about things from their, their perspectives, be genuine. Um, and, and all of these simple suggestions really open doors and opportunities for you as well. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Jerry, unless you've got some additional questions, Jerry. Great job, Mike. And I just, <clears throat> I want to know if the young man that was uh, driving the Viper in the picture was also the one that got to ride the robot. No, I was, uh, I didn't, I didn't get a good picture of me riding the robot. <laughs> I probably would have gotten fired for that. But um, the Viper was pretty cool because it was the, uh, it was the, the, the sixth Viper ever made. And they said, please do not crash this. It's a million dollar car because there's only six. It's all handmade. So a little bit of nervousness there as you're driving around the roads of Holland, you know, before it had ever, ever even got launched out and released. So cool experience, though. Awesome. Well, you guys all did an amazing job. I learned so much from each one of you, and I'm sure our students did as well. Thank you for all the information that you shared and your time today. Uh, just a quick reminder to our students and educators about the survey. Uh, Carol Distel is going to help me now with some of the questions. Uh, we're going to ask some of your questions from the Q&A chat and anything else that you've thought of. Thanks again.